نحمده و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرخ لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل اقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیر من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم الہمنا رشدن و عائزنا من شرور انفسنا اللہم ارن الحق حقا و رزقن اتباعا اللہم ارن الباطل باطلا و رزقن اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہو الحمدللہ today we are going to start with the tafsir of surat al-nisa it is a madani surat with 24 chapters and 176 verses fourth by the order of arrangement and the 92nd surah according to the order of revelation the time period when the surat al-nisa was revealed is more towards the end of the third hijri till the end of the fourth or the start of the fifth hijri this was the period following the battle of Uhud in 3rd Hijri. During the battle, 70 Muslims had lost their lives and 70 were severely injured. So, in Medina, there was a, a very big and a huge issue of women being widowed. There were often children. There was the issue of inheritance and the concept of wills. So after the battle of Uhud, Surah Nisa was revealed to explain and to guide all the rules and the regulations and the laws of inheritance and marriage with these widows was allowed. So to settle all these issues, the guidance of Surah Nisa came up and it gave the laws of inheritance and all the different situations were settled down. When we're we going to um, study the all the principles and all the laws of Surah Nisa, we will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained the laws and the rules and regulations for the Muslims in four circles. So we will start with Surah Nisa from the most inner circle and that innermost circle of the Muslim society, the basic unit of the society is the house. So in the first few chapters of the surah, we will be discussing about the, the method of nikah, the rights of the husband and the wife and their duties, what happens if there arises a quarrel between them and how and when and who will settle it. So there will be discussion of the basic unit. And in it, we will also be discussing about the laws of inheritance. After this, when we come out of the house, there will be the rules and there will be commandments about the social dealings. How are we supposed to deal with our parents, with our siblings, with our relations of kings, with neighbors, with slaves and so on and so forth. And the third cycle would be, the third circle would be about a Muslim state. There will be orders and there will be uh, laws and rules and regulations regarding an Islamic state as to what will be the foreign affairs of an Islamic country, what is the Ministry of Interiors and what is the Ministry of the Exterior Affairs supposed to behave and react and relate like. And then after this, the last but not the least will be the orders for the Muslim Ummah. So these will be the four circles we will be talking about in Surah Nisa, moving from the inner to the outer circle. And before I start talking about the tafsir of Surah Nisa, I would want to highlight one thing. Nisa means women. And if you can relate and you notice that there is a surah in Quran which is named after the name of women but there is no surah in Quran which is named after the men folk there is no surah like surah Rajul and this I'm wanting to highlight just because I want all Muslim women to get 
clear of all the misconceptions the West is trying to create against Islam and against the teachings of Quran. If you see, there are a lot of allegations against the teachings of Quran and the Muslim women are being misguided and uh, allegations to defame the teachings of Quran and the principles of Islam. They, they very commonly say that the orders of Quran are very strict for the women and the, there are undue restriction on the Muslim women and the teachings of Islam and Quran for the Muslim women are very harsh and very tough. And Islam does injustice for the women and Islam is religion which oppresses Muslim women. So I wanted to clarify and I wanted to highlight this that Islam is a religion and Quran is a book which, which holds the charter of women rights. Prophet وسلم, came as the savior and the protector of the women rights. Today, if the societies of the world, may it be Islamic countries, may it be the non-Muslim countries, if the societies in the world, they are not giving women their due rights, then the procedure or the steps to let the women have, the oppressed women have their due rights is not making up the NGOs for women liberation or to come out in the streets and to protest and to shout slogans like women liberation. But the right and the correct method is to spread the teachings of Quran. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who used to suggest that teach Surah Nisa to your men folk. And this is a very rational and a very logical suggestion. You know, Surah Nisa suggests and protects the rights of the Muslim women. And if obviously the men folk, the Muslim men, they will read the orders and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Nisa, then they being the fathers, the brothers, the husbands, the sons, they will be uh, obviously paying the due rights of their wives, their mothers, their daughters or, or their sisters. Islam protects and teaches to protect the rights of the women of Islam. Before the teachings of Islam in Arabs, women was considered as a commodity. She was sold, she was bought, she was inherited. The daughters were buried live. And when the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu came, they reformed the society. The biggest ever revolution, the biggest ever revolution in the world did what? It elevated the society. It elevated the Muslim women in the society. When a woman in Islam becomes a mother, the Prophet Sallallahu is heard telling his companions who was wanting to go to jihad, the Prophet ﷺ instructed this mujahid, Farjari ilayha fa innal jannata inda rijliha. Return towards your mother because there's no doubt that your paradise is under the sole of your mother's foot. When, when a Muslim woman becomes a wife, the Quran says, Ashiruhunna bil maruf. When she becomes a wife, the Prophet ﷺ is heard instructing the Muslim husbands, the best of you is he who is good to his wife. The Prophet ﷺ says that a morsel, a gift a husband gives to his wife is his best sadaqa. When a Muslim woman becomes a daughter, the Prophet ﷺ says, La takrihul banati inni abul banat. See, O oh Muslims, you do not dislike your daughters. See, I am the daughter, I am the father of daughters only. And then the Prophet says, who is put into trial by two daughters and he does not prefer his sons over his daughters and he loves his daughters and he looks after them and he provides and fence and fetches for them and he trains them and educates them. And when they get adult, he marries them off, then 
Prophet ﷺ has promised, He will be with me in Jannah. And the Prophet ﷺ joined his two fingers, the middle finger and the index finger, to, to explain how close this person who will be loving and protecting and attending to the daughters will be. And when it comes to the matter of a sister, the Prophet ﷺ says, Should I not tell you the best sadaqa? Your sister who returns to you, who returns or comes back to you once she is widowed or she is divorced. So this is Islam and this is the protection of rights of Muslim women in Islam. With this perspective in mind, let's now start Surah An-Nisa. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا قصيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا the first verse of Surah Nisa. This verse has a specific merit that it was incorporated in the sermon the Prophet ﷺ used to recite at the, at the occasion of nikah or at the sermon of wedding. So before trying to explain the meaning and the message of this ayah, I think we should be able to relate very clearly that if this ayah was always recited at the time of nikah, the time when both the husband and the wife and the, both the families were present, if this was always narrated at that occasion, it obviously and very obviously seems to be explaining and it seems to have some very beautiful and some golden tips for a happy and a successful marital relationship and a happy family life. So what are the points which are highlighted in this first ayah of Surah Tunisa? Ya ayyohunna suttaku rabbakum. O mankind, fear your Lord. Fear your Lord or fear your Rabb. The ayah is asking and is suggesting taqwa, fear of the Lord. And you see that for a very happy and a healthy family life, it is very and essentially important that the members of the family be God-fearing. If the members of the family in their manners, in their behaviors, in their dealings, in their attitudes are fearing of Allah and they are not in their manners, in their behaviors, in their attitudes, they do not fear their relatives, their spouse, their neighbors, their family members, but in fact are fearing Allah, then the family will be a very happy family. Because you know, like if I make you understand with a very simple example, if the wife, if the wife is just fearing her husband, means that she's just afraid, she's just afraid of her husband, then, and she behaves well with her with her relatives just because she's afraid of her husband then she will and she thinks that if she mistreats his father or his mother or if she mis misbehaves with with her with his sister he'll be angry and he'll be annoyed or he'll scold her or he'll be unhappy and upset then you know her behavior and her mannerism will be will be fine till he is around and the moment he walks out of the house she will be misbehaving, she will be ill-treating, and she might be shouting, she might be yelling. But if the fear is for Allah, so 
that is that is how if all the members of the family are god fearing the family will be a happy family the husband should fear allah the wife should fear the would have the fear of allah so this is the first step of surah an-nisa next allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says allazi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida who created you from one soul why is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning the creation from one soul and nafsin wahida i can relate it to the sermon of the last hajj where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam very clearly announced he was saying o oh, you people no white no white has superiority over a black and no arab has superiority over a non arab o oh, sons of adam you are all the offsprings of adam so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying min nafsin wahida is actually trying to negate and trying to rule out all forms of arrogance because you know if the members of the family are arrogant and they are proud then they will not mix up they will no they will not be any intermingling and there will be like if if one family member has a superiority complex and in this superiority he is or her, she is just looking to, down upon the rest of the family members then they will not be able to mix up and the bond of love will not grow and will not flourish so the second tip for a happy marital relationship and a happy successful life is to take out all forms of arrogance may it be of our worldly riches may it be of our our wealth of our qualifications of our family bonds and ties may it be of our degrees may it be of our beauty no no arrogance this is the second tip and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that i have created you from what i have created you from one soul and created from it it's made and dispersed from both of them many men and many women so the next thing which in this ayah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying khalaqa min ha zawjaha allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has announced that the spouse the husband and the wife they are zawj zawj means a pair and we can very clearly relate that in a pair both the things are similar they are alike they are equal and they are parallel and not only this but both are dependent on each other for their completion so that is how exactly in islam a husband and a wife are in the eyes of allah neither one of them is inferior or nor is the other superior they are both equal they are both similar they are both parallel and they both depend on each other for running of their family for running of their house smoothly and they are both dependent on each other but before i go forward i need to clarify and highlight that although the spouse the husband and wife are both equal but they are yet different allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the man has the woman physically emotionally constitutionally socially economically different so because they are different allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made different spheres of life for them the man is strong is tough is hardy he is strong physically he is strong emotionally so that is why his sphere of life his duties of life are outside the heart outside the house he is supposed to go out of the house he is supposed to earn he is supposed to fend fetch and provide for the family members so his sphere of the life is outside the house and the woman the woman is soft she is weak she is physically she is emotionally weak 
she is labile she is temperamental and yet she is caring she is more soft hearted she is more merciful so her sphere of life and her sphere and circle of duties is within the house to look after the young children to protect and to take care of the old parents so we see allah subhana taala has made them different and has allocated them different spheres of life so we have to very clearly understand and comprehend that in a muslim house there is no there is no fighting there is no there is no snatching a muslim home is not a battlefield the muslim husband and wife are not daggers drawn they are not shouting they are not yelling they are not snatching they are not trying to snatch back their rights what both of them are doing is that they are conscientiously busy they are both busy they are both of them are busy conscientiously doing their duties because they know that on the day of the judgment they will be asked for it and they might be punished for it if they have not paid their duties properly but as far as they are their rights are concerned they have tawakkul ila allah and they know that allah the just will repay their rights on the day of the judgment in a way much better the humans could have paid so this is the concept of zawjaha and fear allah through whom you ask one another and the wombs tasaluna bihi wal arham so the next thing again which is very important for a happy family life and a very successful marital relationship is to be sensitive and to be caring and to be kind to the relations of kin tasaluna bihi wal arham inna allah kana alaykum raqiba indeed allah is ever over you and observer wa atul yatama amwalahum wala tatabaddalu al khabisa bit tayyib ولا تقلوا اموالهم الى اموالكم انه كان حبا كبيرا and give to the orphans their properties and do not substitute the defective of your for the good of theirs and do not consume their properties in your own indeed that is ever a great sin this ayah number 2 of surah nisa is addressing the person who is the caretaker of an orphan child and this is allah subhanahu wa taala is asking them not to consume the properties of the orphan and allah subhanahu wa taala has announced and highlighted it as a huban kabira as a great sin and if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls what was this wa in khiftum alla tuqsitu fil yatama ayat number the verse number 3 allah subhanahu wa taala is talking about fear of not being able to ju- deal justly with the with the orphan girls hazrat aisha radhiyallahu taala and her reports that it was a norm and it was a custom in the arab society that if the uh, a person if a man was the guardian of an orphan girl then when she grew up and when she got to her adulthood if uh, her beauty and if her charm appealed him and she liked her then he would even if she was not prepared to marry her uh, to marry him he would forcibly got get married to her and uh, this was also because he wanted to keep control of her wealth and of her inheritance and on the other hand if uh, her charm her beauty did not appeal him and he was not fond of her then he would neither marry her himself and nor would he let her get married to somebody else because he was scared that if she got married to somebody else then he would ask for his inheritance and uh, he would have to hand him over the wealth so allah subhanahu wa taala says that if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls then marry those that you please of other women allah subhanahu wa taala says ma tawaba lakum min an-nisa'i you get married to women that please you and according to this ayah 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits the concept of getting the willingness of both the girl and the boy, the man and the woman before they get married. That please you of other women two or three or four. But if you fear that you will not be just, then just marry one or those your right hand possesses. That is more suitable that you may not incline to injustice. Now, the third ayah of Surah Tunnisa is permitting the Muslim men to marry two, three or four women at a time. This order of uh, Surah Nisa is again a concept which has been very uh, badly used to misguide and to defame Islam. And uh, it has been said that Muslim men are allowed to marry so many women and the Muslim women are deprived and they are being oppressed and it it is an order of injustice for the Muslim women. The first thing which I want to relate and explain is that all these commandments are the commandments of Allah who is Hakim. And all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are full of hikmat. We might under certain conditions might be able to understand the hikmah of Quran and then there are going to be commandments of whose hikmah we might not be able to comprehend. But we have to have a very strong faith and conviction that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran is full of hikmah and we need to understand the hikmah of Quran and obey, obey and accept the orders as they are and for whatever they are. Now, relating back to the period when these this order was revealed, that was a period when the Arab men were used to marrying many women at a time. Just to give you an idea, when this order of marrying maximum of four women was allowed, there were among the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, Hazrat Ghilan bin Abi Salma, he had 10 wives. And Hazrat Humair Asadi, he had 8 wives. So after this order of the Quran came, Prophet ﷺ asked them to divorce the rest and they were just allowed to keep 4 wives in their nikah. So this in that Arab society was actually an order of Quran to limit the number of women to 4. But this I would also want to explain it is not a command it is not an obligatory order of Allah it is not a farizai deen and it is not a sunnate muakada of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is an option it is an option and it is a permission which has been granted to the Muslim men for certain situations, like, for example, a wife may be sick, may be weak, she may be unhealthy and she may not be able to bear children, or physically being weak or sick, she may not be able to uh, attend to the requirements and to the physical, emotional, or the domestic needs of the husband. So in these difficult situations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed, has permitted, has given an option to the Muslim men that they can marry another woman. You see, if under this situation, if the man was not allowed to marry another woman and just he was just allowed to have one wife, then under these situations, which I've explained, it, it might be, it might happen that he might just divorce the previous wife and he might get married to another wife. In this situation, the previous wife would be deprived of all the rights. The family system and the home would, would break up and the children and the wife would be totally deprived. Similarly, if the husband is not allowed to divorce and not even allowed to marry another woman, and these are the things as are there in other religions 
So if he would be neither allowed to remarry, to marry another woman or not to divorce the previous wife, but the condition is the same that the wife is not capable enough of uh, fulfilling his physical or his emotional requirements, then there might be certain men who might be able to, uh, who might have self-control, but all five fingers are not equal. There might be men who might indulge into haram activities, who might uh, be committing adultery and who might go in illegal or unlawful relationships. So to prevent all this, all this immorality in a Muslim society, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in his book permitted the Muslim men to marry more than one woman, but this permission and this option has been strictly conditioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you see in this ayat, is clearly highlighting fa in khiftum Allah ta'dilu fa but if you fear that you will not be just, that if you cannot do justice, then just marry one. That anybody who cannot be just will practically not be able, you are not, you cannot avail of this option or you cannot avail of this permission. And you know, justice is in practically in forms of all worldly matters. He is supposed to be just related to the money issues, to the time, to the turn, everything he has to be totally just. And in a hadith, Prophet wasallam narrates that if a person is put into trial with more than one wives and he is not he is not just between them, that is he doesn't do justice among the wives, then on the day of the judgment he will be he will be raised with half of his body. That is either he will half a part of his body will be cut off or either half of his body will be paralyzed. So this is a order of Quran which we need to understand and it is not as a, as a order which is an oppression for the Muslim women but it is an order which has been given as a permission to prevent immorality and adultery in a Muslim society. And give the Muslim women upon marriage their bridal gifts graciously. But if they give up willingly to you anything of it, then take it in satisfaction and ease. And do not give the weak-minded your property. By weak-minded, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here means the orphan children who are young and who are uh, who are not adults yet and who cannot uh, handle their money and who cannot handle their economic matters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do not give the weak-minded their property, that is the property of inheritance, which is with the person who is looking after them, which Allah has made a mean of sustenance for you, but provide from them for it and clothe them and speak to them with words of appropriate kindness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told that you do not hand them over the money because they might not be able to look after it and they might not be able to spend it properly, but keep on providing them for it. That is a don't of Quran. And it is a rule of the Quran that wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and tells a don't, Allah always tells and instructs what is the do. So Allah says, don't give them. So what do you do? What do you do? Ayat number 6, Allah says, and test the orphans in their abilities until they reach marriageable age. Then, if you perceive in them sound judgment, release their properties to them and do not consume it excessively and quickly, anticipating that they will grow up. And whoever, when acting as a guardian, is self-sufficient, should restrain from taking a fee. And whoever is poor, let him take accordingly to what is acceptable. Then when you release their properties to them, bring witness upon them, and sufficient is Allah as an accountant. Now, the verse number 7. لِلْرُّجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّ تَرَقَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرِبُونَ وَالْأَقْرَبُونَ وَالْلِنِّسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّ تَرَقَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَبُونَ مِّمَّ قَلَّ مِنْهُ أَوْ قَثُرْ 
nasibam mafruza. For men is a share of what parents and close relatives leave, and for women is a share of what parents and close relatives leave, be it little or much, an obligatory share. So from now, verse number 17 to verse number 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be giving the Islamic jurisprudence of inheritance, that is the Quranic laws of inheritance. And how important it is to understand, to read and to learn about the laws of inheritance. I will narrate a few ahadith. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Ibn Majah that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said useful knowledge are only three in number. Knowledge of the Quranic verses, knowledge of the Prophet's sunnah and knowledge of the laws of inheritance. So you see how, how very important the knowledge of the laws of inheritance is. Similarly, Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who reports in Ibn Majah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, learn the laws of inheritance and teach it to the people. It is half of the useful knowledge. It is going to be forgotten and it is going to be the first to be raised of my people. Similarly, Hazrat Ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Musnad Ahmad that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered, learn the Quran and teach it to others. Learn the law of inheritance and teach them to others. Because I am a human being. I am going to die and the knowledge will disappear and a time will come when two people will argue about the division of their inheritance and there will be no answer to their problems. So this is what instructs and guides us and lets us know how very important it is to understand these laws of inheritance for all of us. So now we will be going through the whole of uh, the rules and regulations which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us. And uh, before this, I would uh, want you to understand that uh, when these rules of uh, inheritance were revealed, what was the norm in the Arab society? The Arabs used to, they never used to give inheritance to their widows or to their women folk. And they used to deprive even their orphan children. And they had a very queer and a very erratic way of uh, their uh, inheritance. And it was like that the two men who were like friends with each other, they used to say very, uh, they used to make a very silly pact and a very silly sort of a covenant between each other. And they used to say that uh, I'm your friend and you're my friend. Your blood is my blood and my blood is your blood. Your life is my life and my life is your life. Your money is my money and my money is your money. And you are my heir and I'm your heir. And saying this, saying these words, they assumed and they thought that they would become the normal heirs. And this is how they used to transfer their uh, the inheritance to their normal fellow beings and to their friends and deprive their uh, widows and deprive the young orphan children of all the inheritance. And uh, the laws of uh, Surah Nisa, they were revealed after Ghazwai Uhud when there was an occasion that a companion of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Saad bin Rabia Raziallahu Ta'ala Anhu, when he lost his life, the wife of uh, the martyr came over to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam complaining that uh, she has a son and she has two daughters and uh, the paternal aunt of the orphan children, they uh, he happens to get hold of all the property and all the inheritance and he has uh, deprived us of all the inheritance. So when the widow came over with this question and with this issue, 
she was replied by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam by these aya when they were revealed and uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in detail guided all muslims regarding the rights of all the heirs and has explained who will be the heir and who will be the righteous of inheritance so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying for men is a share of what parents and close relatives leave and for women is a share of what parents and close relatives leaves so allah in this ayat has clearly highlighted that muslim women will be the natural will be the normal heirs according to the teachings of quran in our society here in pakistan as well as in many other societies the Mis muslim women are being deprived maybe their wives maybe as daughters maybe as mothers or sisters in certain situations they are being deprived of their religious right of inheritance in our society the replacement of inheritance to the muslim women is by providing them dowry at the time of their wedding this dowry at the time of wedding which has been provided to daughters and to sisters is not a custom of islam we have acquired this custom from some other peoples from some other nations and dowry is a it is a method and it is a way the women are given their economic support by making them a burden a dowry makes a muslim woman a burden for her father for her brother and the whole life she is a burden for the family and actually what happens in our society is that at the time of the wedding when the muslim daughters and uh, uh, sisters they are given their dowry and the fathers and the brothers they spend for all the dowry it is either by actual word of mouth they are told or directly or indirectly they are conveyed by any means that they have now got their right and that at the time of death of any of the family members they should not be coming up asking for their right of inheritance because they've been given whatever they deserved just remember this this concept of dowry is making a muslim woman a burden on the shoulders of her father and on the shoulders of her of her brother but islam islam gives gives a muslim woman her right her right as an inheritance as a right she is not a burden islam ensures that her feelings her sentiments her emotions her esteem her self her self respect her ego is not hurt so this is our beautiful religion which and this is our wonderful quran which is even protecting our feelings and our sentiments so allah subhanahu wa taala has given the right to the men folk and the women in islam and then allah subhanahu wa taala in ayat number 8 says and when other relatives that is the relatives who are not the heirs and the orphans and the needy are present at the time of division division of what the division of the inheritance then provide for them something out of the estate and speak to them of words of appropriate kindness this has been instructed so that uh, the people who are dividing the inheritance uh, may give uh, some of the wealth of the property of inheritance to the poor to the needy relatives or to the orphans so that it becomes a sadaqai jariya for the deceased and then allah says that speak to them with the words of appropriate kindness means that if uh you do not want to give them or you do not have to give them then at least uh answer to them and uh, get apologize from them in a very kind and in a very merciful manner and let those executors and guardians fear injustice as if they themselves had left weak offsprings behind and feared for them so let them fear allah and speak words of appropriate justice indeed those who devour the property of orphans unjustly are only consuming into their bellies fire and they will be burned into a blaze 
So this is the importance. The verse number 10 of Surah An-Nisa very clearly highlights innama yaquluna fi butunihim nara fa sayaslawna sa'ira they are consuming into their bellies the fire of the hell how important it is to be to be aware and to be dutiful in giving off this inheritance according to the laws of Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it is like filling your bellies with fire. There are many ahadis in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Prophet sallallahu wa sallam has narrated the punishment of the people who do not obey the laws of inheritance. In the sermon of the last hajj, Prophet sallallahu wa sallam announced, O oh people, I advise you to stay away from the property of the two weak the orphans and the widows. Then in a hadith reported in Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Mu'abikat, seven destructive sins. Number one, finding partners with Allah, magic, taking riba or indulging in riba, killing or forbidding, a killing a forbidden soul, devouring the orphan's wealth, taking back from the battlefield and Accusing, accusing the chaste, innocent women of immorality or adultery. So in the seven destructive big sins is devouring the orphan's wealth. Prophet Wasallam in another hadith said that I saw people in hell whose lips were as big as camels and angels were opening their mouth and they were putting stones of fire in their mouth. And when I asked that who are these people, I was told they were the people who had devoured the wealth of the orphans. Similarly, in another hadith, Prophet Wasallam said, four people who Allah would not let enter the paradise. And similarly, in another hadith, Prophet Wasallam said, four people who will be deprived even of the scent of the paradise or Jannah. These four people in both these ahadiths are what? Those who indulged in sooth, those who, who were habitual of drinking, that is wine, and those who disobeyed or mistreated their parents, and those who devoured the wealth of the orphans. So this is the importance according to Quran and hadith to know, to understand, and to obey the laws of inheritance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now explains the law of inheritance and he explains in ayat number 11, Allah instructs you concerning your children for the male. Now Allah is going to give us the fractions for the children, for the spouse and for the parents. Allah instructs you concerning your children for the male, that is for the son, what is equal to the share of two females, that is the daughter. This again is a point where there's a lot of hue and cry and this again is used to misguide Muslim women saying that, see, Islam gives a double right of inheritance to the daughter, uh, to the son as compared to the daughter, to the husband as compared to the wife, and to the brother even in certain conditions when the brothers and sisters are getting the inheritance. So this is a, a, a very big injustice on the part of Quranic educations. What is this? Why is the daughter being given half as compared to the son? Just let me explain you in short. You know that in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts no economic commitment on a Muslim woman. The Muslim women are allowed to own their personal property. They are allowed to earn according to the limits of Quran and Sharia. And when they earn, and when they possess their property, her property and her wealth is just her wealth. She has no duty. She has no obligation of 
any family member whatsoever. She is not provide, supposed to provide for her father, for her brother, for her son, for her husband in any form whatsoever. Moreover, beyond that, any Muslim brother, father, husband or son cannot force her mother, daughter, any Muslim relationship women to earn for him. And if she is earning, he cannot forcibly take it from her. And if he does so, he is doing a sin. He is committing a sin. So in this background, when she uh, she is allowed to earn, she is allowed to own her own personal uh, property. And moreover, she has no economic commitments. In this background, she is still on top of all this being supposed to be provided by her father, by her brother, by her son, by her husband in all relationships. It is like she is getting a stipend from all of them. It is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is allowing her to get a scholarship from all of them. Her, her mal, her her wealth is her wealth and she is on top getting her sustenance and her source of income from all her main relatives and they're supposed to give it to her and now at the time of division of inheritance she's again also again been given this she's again been given right in this and on the contrary if we just look at the muslim man the muslim man in all relationships, may he be a husband, a brother, a father, a son, he is duty bound. It is an obligation for him to fend, to fetch, to provide and to look after and to economically support the women folk around him. He cannot ask them to earn for her. He cannot ask her to ask all these women to earn for him and he cannot he cannot forcefully take out from their from their wealth and now at the time of inheritance is like is like one of the only few situations in his life when he is at the receiving end so now when he is at the receiving end one of the only few situations in his life he is being given twice as compared to the muslim women because in future again he will be providing for them and he will be looking after them and he will be he will be providing and he will be supporting them so that is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the son double share as compared to the daughter but if they're only daughters that is if the deceased doesn't have a son if they're only daughters two or more for them is two third of one's estate and if there is only one that is one daughter for her is half now for the parents to each of the parents each one of them is one sixth of his his means what the deceased one sixth of his estate if he left children but if he left no children that the deceased person had no children and the parents alone inherit for him then for his mother is one third and if he had brothers or sisters for his mother is one sixth after any bequest he may have made or debt your parents and your children you know not which of them are nearest to you in benefit these shares are an obligation imposed by allah indeed allah is ever knowing and wise and for you, that is for the Muslim husband, now the share of the spouse. And for you is half of what your life, wives leave if they have no children. But if they have children, for you is one fourth of what they leave after any bequest that you may have made or debt. And for the wives is one fourth if you leave no children. But if you leave children, then for them is an eighth of what you leave after any bequest you may have made or debt. And if a man or a woman leaves neither ascendants, that is the deceased doesn't have any parents, uh, any ascendants, that is he doesn't have any parents, nor descendants, that is no children or offsprings. This uh, deceased person in the language of the Quran 
and sharia is known as a kalala that is a person who neither has parents nor has children is known as a kalala the kalala's inheritance will be divided among the brothers and the sisters the right for the real brothers and sisters uh, we will be discussing towards the end of surah nisa here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, giving the rights of the step sisters and brothers that is the maternal step sisters and brothers and uh, they will be uh, given the rights of the parents allah says but if they are more uh, they uh, but the descend uh, they do not have any ascendants or descendants but has a brother or sister then for each of them is sixth but if they are more than two then their share will be third after the bequest which was made or the debt as long as they as long there is no detrimental caused this is an ordinance from allah and allah is knowing and forbearing so now uh we get to the whole view allah subhanahu wa taala has explained the rights of the children and the parents and the spouse but as i was reading the whole uh of the verse the translation of the verse you must have noticed that repeatedly the two things which were repeatedly being mentioned were that the bequest you may have made or the debt so we need to understand what is this all about bequest is that if a person wants to give share of his money or property or his personal belongings to anyone by will before he passes off so this is the concept of bequest so according to this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the orders of sharia will or wasiya is allowed and it is permissible it is not only permissible to make will in one's own property before passing away but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in fact instructs us about making this will hazrat abdullah bin umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in bukhari and muslim that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is not proper for a muslim who has anything like land goods money anything about which a will ought to be made that he allows two nights to pass in a condition that its deed has not been prepared and it is not with him so the hadith clearly instructs all those people who want to make a will for their inheritance that this will has to be in form of a written deed it is not supposed to make we are not supposed to make will verbally or orally by word of mouth because obviously there will be like misunderstandings mis uh, interpretations and there will be confusions and mal our money or wealth in nama amwalukum wa auladukum fitna so to prevent all muslims from this fitna the hadith has clearly instructed us that we need to write down and put the uh, the will in black and white in form of a paper and then this will has to be according to the orders and according to the laws of the sharia because uh, if it is not according to the laws of the sharia and it is detriment then it is uh, not permissible in islam hazrat uh, jabir bin abdullah radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in ibn majah that uh, the messenger of allah muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever died in the state of wasiya that is in the state that he had made the will concerning his property and other affairs he ought to have in accordance with sharia he died on the right path in observance of the commandments of sharia his death will be the death of piety and martyrdom and he and his sins will be forgiven so the uh, the will has to be made according to the laws and the commandments of the sharia and uh, about the will uh, we can understand by an incidence in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that on how much of our property and of our wealth are we entitled to make uh, our will 
حضرت سعد بن نبی وقاص رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ ریٹس انسیڈنٹس ان بخاری اینڈ مسلم ہی سیز دیٹ آئی واز سیریسلی ایل اینڈ دا پروفیٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کیم اوور ٹو وزٹ می اینڈ ہی سیز دیٹ آئی اونلی ہیڈ ون ڈاٹر اینڈ نو ادر چائلڈ اینڈ آئی آسٹ دا پروفیٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم دیٹ می آئی بیکویسٹ آل مائی پراپرٹی فار دا سیک آف اللہ that is may i request it for charity the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no don't do it then has asad bin abi waqas said that i asked again that should i bequest three fourth of my property and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam refused then he asked that can i make will of two third of my profit uh, of my property uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again refused and then he asked that should i make will of one third of my property for charity prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that yes if you like and if you want but it is better that if you decrease it so according to this hadith it is permissible that a man can make will out of one third of his property like if somebody has uh, left behind or has uh, 90000 rupees in his account and he wants to make a will then he can make a will up to 30000 rupees and he cannot make will more than that so this is the limitation and uh, explaining as to why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed a person to make will is firstly because it was his hard earned money so allah allows him and permits him to spend a little part of it even after his uh, life on whatever and wherever he wants to and secondly uh, the actual cause what i comprehend and relate is that allah has explained the right of the heirs like the parents the children and the spouse but every person might have some relations or some relatives around him other than these uh, prescribed relatives and these fractions which allah has explained like there may be a poor nephew or there may be a sick aunt or there may be any other relation which that person might be wanting to spend or wanting to give share after their life so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed the concept of will to one third of one's property in his life and uh, there's another concept which we need to understand about this will is has that uh, abu umama radiyallahu ta'ala and who reports in abu daud in ibn majah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the lord that is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined the share of every one in the holy book that is the legal heirs have been clearly highlighted in quran i repeat again allah has determined the share of everyone having a law lawful claim so it is not allowable now to make a will in the respect of an heir so any person before his death if he is going to make a will out of one third of his property this will cannot be made for the children for the spouse or for the parents because allah has already given them their due right and if anyone makes a will in favor of them this will be against the concepts and laws of sharia so this is the concept of the will which we can understand very clearly and the second thing which has been repeatedly mentioned is the debt or the loan loan or the debt is a very serious matter and it should be dealt with in a very serious manner loan when taken on the part of the debtor it is an amana and it is a promise and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah mu'minun narrating the narrating the behavior of the believers says وَالَّذِينَ لِأَمَانَتِهِمْ وَأَحْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ That the believers and mu'minun are the people who protect and who look after and who take care of their amana and their promises. So it is a very grievous and unforgivable sin to die without paying off one's debts. Prophet ﷺ had these 
narrates Hazrat Abu Musa Ashri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Musnad Ahmad and Abu Dawood that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that after the major sins, that is finding partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in adultery, that after the major sins from which Allah has strictly enjoined us to abstain, the greatest sin is that a man dies in a state that he owed a debt to anyone and left behind no assets to pay it off. Similarly, in another hadith reported by Sayyidina Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala and who in Muslim, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if a person is killed in the path of Allah, all his sins are forgiven except for loan. So this is the importance of trying to pay off the loan. Similarly, Hazrat Abu Qatada radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Muslim that a person came and he asked that, O oh, Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell me that if I take part in jihad with fortitude and steadfastness and solely for the sake of earning the good prayer of Allah and the reward of hereafter, and I get killed in the condition that I am not retreating but advancing, will all my sins be recovered? Will all my sins be forgiven? Prophet wasallam said, yes, all your sins will be forgiven except a debt. This is what I have been told by Jibrail alayhi salam. So this is the importance of trying to pay off the debt and loan before death. Prophet sallallahu manner and uh, routine we learn by a hadith. Hazrat Salma bin Akwa radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari that uh, Prophet sallallahu was requested to lead the Salah funeral. And when he used to arrive to uh, lead the funeral of Salah, the first thing he used to ask about the deceased was that was any debt payable for the deceased? And when somebody used to say and used to ask and tell that he had to pay uh, some amount of debt, then Prophet Wasallam used to ask the heirs to pay the debt off from the property of inheritance. And if there was no inheritance left, then he used to request and ask the heirs to pay off the debt. And if the heirs did not want to or could not pay off the debt, then he used to request the relations of the kin or the Muslim brothers or the friends or the relatives to pay off the uh, debt. And if none of them could or did not pay the debt, then Prophet wasallam, the Hadith tells us when the debt was not paid, he never used to lead the funeral player himself. He used to ask somebody else. He used to ask somebody else to lead this funeral pray, prayer and he used to leave himself. This was just to convey the dislike of not paying the debts. So this is why we need to be extremely sensitive about paying the debts. Similarly, there's a hadith reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever borrows money from anyone and has the intention to return it, Allah will make it possible for him to pay it back. That is, Allah will help him clear it up because he had intention of doing so. And if he cannot do so in his lifetime, Allah will settle it on his behalf in hereafter and thus release him of the responsibility. And then the hadith says, and whoever borrows from anyone and has no intention of paying it back, Allah will have it destroyed, that the money will not only prove as a curse in afterlife, but in this world too, it will be of no help or comfort to him. So if somebody has a debt, he should definitely make an intention and Allah will help him. Similarly, Hazrat Imran bin Hussain radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Nisai that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever takes a loan and it is in the knowledge of Allah that he has the intention of returning it, Allah will have it repaid in his lifetime. 
and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has taught us a dua to um, help allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help of paying of loans and debt allahumma kfini an halalika an haramik wa aghnini bi fadlika amman sibak and uh, hadith by hazrat abdullah bin jafar reported in ibn majah prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said god is with the debtor until the debt is paid uh, until the debt is paid provided that it was not taken for a wrong purpose so this is what is being narrated here that uh, the first thing uh, the things which have to be kept in mind after the deceased is to uh, pay off the debt and the loan clear off the loan and also to uh, complete the will so now uh, if i sum up and uh, in short try to uh, come to the point that how the inheritance is uh, is supposed to be divided first of all when a person uh, passes off then the first thing which has to be done out of the property of inheritance is to pay off the debt and then to uh, make the distribution of the will if the will was according to the laws of the sharia and then the uh, property will be divided to the uh, lawful heirs if the deceased did not have any son then the uh, fractions which has uh, which allah has uh, explained in the quran will be taken from the total property the two third or half of uh, for the daughters and the rights of the parents the fractions for the parents and the fractions from the spouse all will be taken from the total property of inheritance and if any of the property remains then it will be given off to the usba the usba being the nearest and the dearest male relative of the deceased and uh, on the contrary if the deceased had uh, sons as well then first of all the debt and the loan will be paid off then the will will be given off and after this the rights of the spouse and the parents will be taken and given off the fractions of the spouse and the parents the property which will remain it will be divided between the daughters and the sons in the ratio of 1 is to 2 that is one part for the daughters and uh, two parts for the son for example if a deceased property uh, the loan has been given off and the will has been given off and the spouse and the parents relations uh, the parents rights have all been given off and uh, like 54000 rupees or dollars remain and imagine that there were two uh, sons and two daughters say, then out of this 54000 we will make how many shares and how many parts uh two parts for one each for the daughter and uh, four parts for the son the two parts each for the two sons so a total of six shares will be made out of this 54000 and uh, the sons will really uh, will be receiving 18 18000 each and the daughters will be getting 9000 each and a uh, property of uh, the deceased will finish off but if uh, the prop if the deceased did not have any son then the remaining property will be handed over to the uspa so this is the proper way of uh, dividing the property of inheritance according to the islamic laws of jurus uh, uh, islamic law of inheritance Now in the end, ayah number or verse number thirteen, Allah says, "These are the limits. These are the limits set by Allah, and whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger will be admitted by Him to gardens in the paradise under which rivers flow, abiding eternally therein, and that is the greatest attainment. And whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger and transgresses His limits." he will put him into the fire to abide eternally therein and he will have a humiliating punishment what will be the humiliating punishment let me wind up with the hadith hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in musnad ahmad tirmizi abu daud and ibn majah four books of sahih sitta reported by Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said 
Sometimes it is so that a person leads a life of obedience to Allah for 60 years. You understand? That there is a person who has spent his life for 60 years in the obedience of Allah. And then as the time of his death approaches, he acts unjustly towards his rightful heirs in his will. And in consequence of this, hell becomes inevitable for him. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Rabban asrif anna azaba jahannum. Inna azabaha qana gharama. Inna ha saad mustaqarrum wa maqama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us learn, help us understand and comprehend the laws of inheritance. Help us remember and obey the laws of inheritance. Help us, help us pass on and teach others these law of inheritance. Rabbana la tuzay qalubana ba'da is khadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen. Summa ameen.